All right, so the objective of this module is that you would be able to construct, describe, and justify an event tree during risk analysis using the elements of a decomposed potential failure mode. We'll do that by discussing the purpose of sub-event trees, walking through the construction process of sub-event trees given a failure mode, going through some of the best practices that we have at the core for the portrayal of structural failure modes in particular, and looking for some example sub-event trees from risk analysis. So the outline for today's presentation is I'm going to go through the definition of what sub-event trees are, the construction process, I'm going to go through some examples of multiple event trees, and then uh, go through the toolbox overview, which is available to all of you through the RMC website that we uh, shared at the beginning. All right, so we'll start off by going through the definition of some event trees. Um, some event trees serve two roles in a risk analysis. The first is that they serve as a graphical representation of the decomposed elements of a potential failure mode uh, description to help ensure that all events required for that failure mode reach failure or breach, and those all those components have been identified. The second role that the sub tree plays are for the risk analysis are as risk analysis tools that are used to calculate the system response probabilities for the individual failure modes. So the sub tree is constructed on a node by node basis with each node in the event tree representing a unique event in the step by step process to failure. It uses Boolean logic to work through the progression of the nodes sequentially from left to right. So now we're going to go through a suggested construction process for a typical sub event tree. This process can serve as a blueprint of sorts, but and can be applied really to any failure mode being evaluated at whatever project you're located. All right, so here are the steps for the sub event tree construction process. Uh, with each one covered in more detail as I go through the presentation. So first is step one is identifying the three elements of the potential failure mode description for the PFM that you're evaluating. This assumes that you already have a complete failure mode description written. Step two is to determine the number and order of sub event tree nodes. Step three is to review the RMC event tree database as a starting point to see if an event tree of similar construction of your PFM already exists. Step four is to draw the sub event tree and assign a title and description for each node. And finally, step five is to ensure that all failure pathways and breach scenarios have been addressed. If not, steps one through four should be repeated until all those scenarios are captured. All right, so we'll be going through these individually. All right, so step one, identify elements in the PFM description. The, it's the first step in the construction process is to identify these elements as was discussed in the last presentation. So we have the initiator, the failure mechanism, and the resulting impact to the structure. In this case, it would be breach. All right, so identify the initiator for the potential failure mode. Is the PFM initiated by a hydrologic event? Is it initiated by a seismic event or degradation of a material or a change in the static loading or change in, in the way it's loaded? Next is the failure mechanism. So define the step-by-step -step progression for your failure mode to get to failure. So identify the location of your of your potential failure mode, as well as the failure pathway that you will be evaluating that in your case is controlling that probability of failure. And then the final element is the resulting impact to the structure. Are you evaluating a full breach or some other damage state? What's the breach mechanism, the magnitude and the breach size? Those are all things that will impact the amount of the consequences that uh, your failure mode leads to. All right, so step two, once you've identified all the necessary, necessary elements of the failure mode description, you move on to step two, which is determining the number and order of the sub event tree nodes. For sub event trees, the initiator always comes first. The next nodes should consist of the step by step progression to failure or breach. As discussed previously, avoid combining unrelated events in your sub event tree ensuring that each unique step in the failure process is represented. That will only make it harder later on if you start combining things. 
Finally, the resulting impact on the structure is the final node in the event tree. All right, so now that your elements have been identified and you have the number and the order of your sub event tree nodes, uh, you can move on to step three, which uh, the RMC has developed an RMC event tree database to provide example sub event trees for many common potential failure modes that you might run into during the evaluation of your specific project. The database is available for download on the RMC website in the risk calculation suite of software tools. You may find that your potential failure mode has already been captured in this database and can serve as a starting point or reference for you to continue to build your sub event tree. While you may not find the exact sub event tree that fits your project, it can still serve as a guide that you can adapt for your specific potential failure mode at your specific location. So I, I do wanna emphasize that um, this is not meant to be a one size fits all database. It is meant to be a guide that you can adjust as needed. All right, next is step four. So drawing the sub event tree and assigning a title and description for each node. Drawing the sub event tree can be easily completed using the RMC event tree toolbox, which is also available for download on the RMC website within the risk calculation suite. Um, Adam is gonna uh, go over an example in the event tree toolbox at the end of this module. So if uh, you can, um, you'll be able to see it in action later. Uh, the toolbox uses specified user specified input to draw a sub event tree following the standard format. And the standard format is what you've seen during this, during these, uh, during this presentation and Adam's last presentation. Uh, a screenshot of the toolbox is shown on the slide and we will go through, like again, we will go through this presentation at the end. Uh, you will assign the initiating event, the number of nodes, and uh, node titles and descriptions. Node titles are used to provide a very brief, usually one to two uh, to three words, identifier for each event. Node descriptions then provide a more detailed explanation of the event. Typically, similar to the question that will be used to evaluate the node during a risk analysis. An example of a title and a description are shown here. The title here is the node is continuation, which is a typical process of internal erosion. The node description is an unfiltered seepage exists, exit exists, allowing erosion to continue. Keep in mind that node titles will not always fall into a category such as flaw, continuation, progression, etc depending on the potential failure mode that you're evaluating. So don't feel the need to always uh, stuff the node into the titles into, into a box. Again, this is a guide, not meant to be an, all, an one size fits all scenario. All right, so the final step in the construction process is step five, ensuring all failure pathways and breach scenarios are addressed. While it's common to have a sub event tree that only consists as a straight line path to one distinct breach or failure, it's not uncommon to have sub event trees that can have multiple paths to failure. We can manipulate our sub event trees to graphically display all possible failure scenarios for a given potential failure mode. So in this example, we have a potential failure mode dealing with a levee or flood wall closure. There are three different ways for a breach to occur. The first way is located at the end of node five, where we must work through all the nodes in the event tree to reach that failure point. However, failure can also occur on the no branch of nodes one and two. This is represented in the, in the sub event tree by the addition of the two red triangles that extend to the end of the sub event tree. To obtain the total probability of failure, all three branches need to be accounted for. So all these, three branches right here. All right, here's another example that adds another twist. So I know this is a lot to look at on the screen, but just uh, bear with us. So in the previous example, we saw a sub event tree with multiple failure paths that all led to the same or very similar breach scenario. The sub event tree on this slide is for a seismic sliding instability of a concrete spillway monolith. Like the previous example, the sub event tree contains multiple paths to failure. Uh, in fact, it, there's 15 pathways to, uh, that can lead to failure. So this sub event tree also contains four different breach scenarios. 
each of which are captured within the 15 failure pathways. So depending on the amount of displacement that occurs in the spillway monolith, the resulting breach size will be either a full monolith breach, a partial monolith breach, a four gate breach or a one gate breach. So these are all dependent on the expected amount of displacement in the monolith. You don't always have to have these. This is just an example that we're that we're using today to kind of portray that you can have different paths to failure with different breach sizes. But in this example, we had uh, four different breach scenarios. So each of these scenarios is captured in the sub event tree to ensure that all possible failure and consequence scenarios are accounted for. So when you get to step five, you must evaluate if all the possible failure pathways and breach scenarios have been captured. If you find that there are some missing, then you need to go back and repeat steps one through four of the construction process until they're all addressed. OK, so here's a, a failure mode description. Let's work through an example so that I can show you what the construction process looks like for a typical failure mode. Um, here we have a complete uh, failure mode description for backwards erosion and piping. Uh, I won't take the time to read through all this. You can do that on your own time, but it does contain all the necessary necessary elements that we've discussed that are that are needed for a full failure mode description in module one. So step one, identify the elements in the PFM description. So for this example, I've created a table that we see here on the screen and populated it with the appropriate elements. By no means, you don't have to do this. This is, uh, this is no, not a best practice or necessary step, but it can help to make sure that all, all the elements are accounted for and that you're consolidating everything and that you're not missing anything. So our first element in this case is the initiator. For this failure mode, the initiator is a hydrologic event tree or a flood loading at the top of active storage. The next element is the failure mechanism, which is further broken down to in the step-by-step -step failure progression, the PFM location and the failure pathway. The step-by-step -step progression for this failure mode has been populated with the appropriate events that must occur for backward erosion and piping. It's okay if you're not familiar with these events. This is uh, the point here is not to teach you about how to evaluate this failure mode, but to kind of walk you through the events that would lead to failure due to backwards erosion piping. The location of the failure mode is in the valley center section of the embankment in this case, and the failure pathway is through the foundation soils with an exit into the downstream unlined tow ditch. Our final element is the resulting impact to the structure composed of the method, the mechanism, and the magnitude of failure. The method of this failure is a breach. The mechanism is gross enlargement leading to overtopping, and the magnitude of the breach is a full embankment breach. Okay, that leads us to step two, determining the number and order of sub tree nodes. We know that the initiator will come first in the sub tree, that, are, that is our flood loading. Next, we include a node for each event in the step-by-step -step failure progression from flaw all the way to the unsuccessful detection and intervention. And then finally, we have a node for the resulting impact of a breach. This brings us to a total of seven nodes in addition to the initiating event for our sub-event tree. So next, we review the RMC event tree database in step three to see if there is a similar sub event tree that already exists. In this case, there is one that's very similar, almost identical to the one we're evaluating for backward erosion and piping. We could use this sub event tree directly for our potential failure mode, or we can uh, just tweak the one that we already had with the specifics for our failure mode and project. But checking the database can save us time and effort, and it can be a very useful guide. Assuming we want to draw our own sub event tree, we can use the RMC event tree toolbox. If you compare this sub event tree to the one in the previous slide, you will see that there was a slight revision to node one description. Otherwise, the two sub event trees are, are pretty much identical. As discussed in step two, we have our initiator as the flood, lo flood loading up, up front, which is right here. Uh, followed by the six step by step progression nodes and capped with the resulting impact to the structure on the breach node at the end. 
The last step in the process is to ensure that all failure pathways and breach scenarios are addressed. For our failure mode, there is only one failure pathway, so we don't need to do anything else, and the construction process is complete. All right, so let's talk a little bit about intervention and how it fits into sub event trees. Um, unsuccessful detection and intervention is a part of the step by step progression of the potential failure mode. Therefore, its placement in the sub event tree will be after the initiator and before the resulting impact of the structure, so before your breach node. The unsuccessful detection and intervention node is typically placed in the sub event tree just be before the resulting impact or the final node in the tree. However, it can be placed elsewhere in the tree if it's appropriate for that failure mechanism being evaluated. For example, the intervention node should be placed at the beginning of the sub event tree directly after the initiator for overtopping erosion. Uh, this is the most likely time in the failure progression that intervention to prevent owner overtopping can occur. On the other hand, there may be some failure modes where detection and intervention may not be practical practicable or possible, such as a brittle failure mechanism that occurs very quickly with little to no warning. So for example, like a gate failure or monolith instability. And in these situations, it may be appropriate to omit this node from the sub event tree altogether. But that can be a decision that you make uh, as a team. All right, so it's time for a knowledge check. Um, this is also on Socrative. Um, so the question is, unrelated events should be combined as much as possible when constructing a sub event tree. So is that true or false? All right, well, great. You, you heard us say that you should not do this <laughs> because you will pay for it later. So unrelated events should not be combined as much as possible when constructing a ventry. You want to make sure that you actually don't eliminate any steps and that you include the step by step progression of the failure mode. All right, knowledge check two. When constructing a sub ventry, intervention should always be placed just before the breach node. Is that true or false? Okay, well, the correct answer for this is false. And the reason for that is because, so think about the, the physical manifestation of an event tree and the progression of that failure mode. So depending on what failure mode you're looking at, um, at the event, at the end of the event tree, just before the breach node, it, it may not fit there. It may not make sense. And the example that we gave is overtopping. So overtopping um, where you might be intervening in that failure mode is right after the initiating event, right after the flood event, when you know that overtopping of the embankment dam is coming, for example. Um, so I think it's always helpful to think about how this the physical progression of the failure mode and then decide where your intervention mode fits best within your event tree. All right, so for the final part of this presentation, we're gonna show you some of the more common sub event trees that we see in risk analysis, as well as some of the sub event trees for potential failure modes that we here at the core have had some trouble within the last few years. So we're gonna just go through some examples, talk over some of these. This is not gonna be a deep dive into um, the technical side of the event tree of why we uh, why we're evaluating a failure mode a certain way, but it's really more a discussion on what event trees should generally look like and things to consider when doing a risk evaluation. All right, so here we have a generic internal erosion event tree. Notice it's very similar to the sub event tree that we looked at during our first example. Uh, when you're evaluating internal erosion, potential failure modes, your event trees should generally follow a similar format to this one. We see all the internal erosion phases, initiation, continuation, progression, and breach. Note that this is a generic event tree. It doesn't account for some of the subtlety, subtleties that lie within each specific mechanism of internal erosion, such as backward erosion piping or concentrated leak erosion. As we discussed uh, prior to this, you should use this generic event tree as a starting point and then adjust it for your project and potential failure mode specific needs. Um, you can always refer to, for additional information, to um, 
DLS 208 for internal erosion risk assessment. Our next example is embankment overtopping erosion. One of the more common failure modes that we're seeing in our current risk assessment. Um, as we discussed before, this is one potential failure mode where we're placing the intervention node early in the sub event tree. Uh, it can make sense. Generally, this is a shorter sub event tree, but take care that you don't overshorten the tree by combining unrelated events. So here again, kind of how we've been talking about, we have flood loading, uh, intervention to prevent overtopping is unsuccessful, so that goes just after the flood loading. Then sufficient overtopping flow exists to remove uh, vegetable cover or slope protection. Head cut develops from the uh, cascading overfalls. Embedded non-erodible feature fails to erode uh, head cut advance, and then you have the breach node at the end. So head cut advances through the crest, uh, leading to uncontrolled release of pool. All right, so this is an example event tree for concrete lined spillway erosion or slab jacking. Um, this is one that it can vary a lot depending on the project that you're working with. So we'll, we'll start off with this one, but we're gonna have multiple examples. Um, this is one where um, at the beginning of, the, of this kind of subsection of this presentation, I said that we've been having some issues. Um, this is one of those because it can be very dependent on some key factors in the project that you're working on. So we're going to go through a few examples, but really kind of always keep in mind, like I said, the, the physical progression of the failure mode is really what's driving what needs to be in, in your event tree. Um, so this represents progression through initiation of slab instability due to flotation and stagnation pressures leading to removal of the slabs, initiation of erosion of the foundation and head cut, unsuccessful intervention, Progression of scour in the vertical and horizontal directions. So you're, you know, eroding your foundation vertically. Um, you're also eroding it horizontally in like undermining your monolith, but also uh, cross valley in your in your spillway. And then that can lead to monolith instability. So should I use this event tree every time I have this type of failure mode? Uh, like I said, like well, like we've mentioned here, this is a good starting place when first evaluating this type of failure. But with all risk evaluations, the team really should evaluate the failure progression within the context of the project and the structure features that you have at your project. Um, nodes one, five, six, and seven. So defensive measures to resist uplift. Scour extends into the foundation. Scour progresses beneath the monolith and scour extends laterally across the spillway monoliths, can all be expanded to have multiple branches as needed to support that evaluation of this failure mode. Uh, so I'm gonna walk you through a couple of other examples um, of a slab jacking and uh, spillway erosion failure mode, just so that you have some ideas of how we might take an inventory and adjust it for specific project information. So this is an example of entry for spillway erosion leading to monolith instability. Um, you can see in this example, node one looks a little different than the last example where we evaluated flotation first. So for this project, flotation wasn't the controlling load case. Um, and it was, uh, it was just very specific to this project, the way that it was founded. It was uh, the spillway we were looking at was um, above, um, um, like it, it wasn't impacted by tailwater. Uh, so flotation wasn't a um, initiator for the progression of this failure mode. Um, so the controlling mechanism here was stagnation pressures. So, so that is why um, we included it that way in the event tree. Additionally, 3D effects were accounted for in the elicitation since the spillway was fairly short with increased stability in the abutment monoliths and increased foundation depth. So if you look at this um, sketch on the left, this is a very short spillway and it had uh, more um, stable monoliths at the abutment. So we could account for 3D effects and the stabilizing forces from the adjacent monoliths to these uh, more shallow monoliths. Uh, so the team did not have multiple branches to evaluate different breach widths because again, this is a a very short spillway. 
and the failure mode was most sensitive to the removal of the slabs and progression of the scour to the monolith. So this is another example of the same failure mode with some additional nodes that were added by the specific team for this project. Um, they added depth of scour, they added undermining of the monolith and the width of scour. So why were these nodes added? So in this event tree for a location, um, for a location where the spillway was very long, it was very symmetrical and it wasn't stable under all static loading conditions. It was very dependent on some key assumptions and the, um, that the team would make and the amount of passive resistance that was available to the monolith to remain stable. So there can be a lot of variability in the outcome of the probability of failure based on those key assumptions that were made by the team as they were doing the analysis. So the depth of scour has a direct impact on stability leading to sliding or no sliding because in this case we were sliding um, at a deep seated sliding plane um, that was um, specifically driven by that erosion of the passive wet. Undermining of the monolith further exacerbates overturning and sliding instability, which was already an issue for this cross section. So this, this monolith was stable for some low cases, it wasn't stable for others. So then once we start undermining the, the uh, monolith, it just exacerbating, it, it exacerbated the problem that already existed. And then three, Width of the scour affects the number of monoliths becoming unstable, leading to changes in the three-dimensional stabilizing forces and the breach width. So when you have a really short spillway, you're gonna have more forces on those exterior monoliths that can stabilize the rest of the monoliths, especially if those abutment monoliths, like I mentioned before, are bigger and have more cross-section. But if you have a very, um, uniform spillway and very long that those stabilizing 3D effects are not going to be as big as they would be with a shorter spillway. So all those things you have to keep in mind to evaluate what kind of breach widths you're going to have, whether you have multiple paths to failure and what kind of things are really important to the event tree. So again, we're not trying to teach you how to evaluate concrete line spillway erosion in this in this um, in this um, workshop. But this is a really good example is how sometimes you, you really can't take a just standard event tree and use it for every scenario that you have. And you really need to be careful that you're making it applicable for the project that you're evaluating. All right, moving on from that example. Um, so here the next example is it's an uh, event tree for failure of a tainer gate due to trunnion friction. This example evaluates multiple trending friction coefficients and evaluates the probability of buckling of the tainer gate strut arm due to the combined compressive and bending stresses. So although intervention would be hard for this failure mode since the strut arms are fracture critical members, uh, we don't want to think about, uh, we do want to think about whether or not it can occur and then followed by a breach by the breach node in this case. So in this case, like I said, like we mentioned before, it might, intervention might not be possible but a lot of times it's good to have this discussion anyways as a group to determine whether it's something that could be that could be attainable at that at that project. Um, and then in this case, it was also followed by the breach node. Uh, for this example, we had a full collapse of the Tainer gate, a partial collapse and then a no breach. Um, an example of a partial collapse for a Tainer gate is exactly how Folsom Dam failed, the gate failed at Folsom Dam due to the trunnion friction. It's the most widely known gate failure due to this failure mechanism. And the gate was held in place by the hoisting chains and didn't fully breach the width of the gate bay. So that's a really good example of a partial breach. And it would, of course, reduce the downstream consequences. So you always want to think about whether you have a potential to have a full gate, a full gate bay breach or something smaller because it does affect your consequences downstream. All right, the next example event tree is for monolith sliding instability under hydrologic loading. Again, this is meant to be a starting point that can be modified based on the needs of the project. Uh, this is another example that it can be very dependent on the project that you're looking at and the key parameters that are um, that the cross section is sensitive to. Um, 
So a few things to highlight in this event tree. It takes you through the progression of initiation of instability, which increases your uplift forces at the heel of your structure and the propagation of the tension crack along the base of your monolith. They evaluate sliding instability at the base uh, on the concrete rock interface. It includes the evaluation of three dimensional effects of the monolith, since we know that these can act as a group, which can add significant stabilizing forces in some cases, and then followed by an intervention node and then the breach node. Note that the breach can be evaluated with multiple breach sizes, dependent on the amount of sliding that is expected. So again, a guide of what you're supposed to be thinking about, but again, definitely not something that you should just take and, and always use this uh, the same event tree. Definitely a starting point, a, a conversation starter. Hey, Gabriella. Right, last, yeah. We had a question on uh, slide 31. I think Adam may have answered in the chat as well, but Harry asked, what are the number two nodes with a plus after the node? What does that yes, mean? Yes, so that's a really good question. So the plus on this node means that this event tree is the same for each node. It's just collapsed so that you can better see it. But the start arm buckling is and then uh, collapse is evaluated for each range in the friction, trunnion friction coefficient. Um, you can do this set up as ranges like we have here, or you can do a Monte Carlo analysis that uses a distribution for trending friction coefficient. But you do want to make sure that you're evaluating all potential um, uh, possible trending friction coefficients since uh, that's not necessarily a known, a known parameter. Does that make sense? I think so. Thanks, Gabriella. No problem. All right. And then um, the last example is an event tree for peer failure under seismic loading. Um, this, you can see um, a very similar event tree in best practices under reinforced concrete failure mechanisms, if you want to read more about that and about this specific um, failure mechanism. But um, Anyways, here there are a total of nine nodes leading the team through the progression of the loading, the coincident pool. In this case, we have a seismic event that happens at the same time as the as a pool loading. So you want to use that uh, pool duration curve. Um, it looks at the behavior of the concrete, the behavior of the steel reinforcement. So does it yield? Does it not yield? Does it remain elastic? Does it rupture? It takes you through the failure mechanism. So is it going to fail in bending or shear? And then uh, collapse of the pier. This is done through these nine nodes in the event tree to properly let, represent the physical attributes of this failure mode. And this in particular is a, an event tree that, that can be kind of cumbersome because you have to look at it both in the upstream downstream direction and in the cross canyon direction, which is how uh, the loading is occurring. So all these examples are made by the toolbox. Um, Adam actually uh, updated this presentation so that they all look very nice from the toolbox because they weren't always like that. So yes, they will all be made by the toolbox. And that's actually a perfect segue because now we're going to have Adam give us a quick tour of what the toolbox can do. <clears throat> all right, now I'd like to go through a quick overview of the RMC event tree toolbox so that you can become a little bit more familiar with it. Like I said before, we're going to have an opportunity or you all will have an opportunity to use the toolbox during our exercises. So you'll get some hands on experience then, but feel free to follow along with me through this overview if you have it downloaded. If you're not familiar with our RMC toolboxes, this is the front page of every toolbox that we offer is the about page that shows the the suite of toolboxes that the particular toolbox that you're using belongs to, in this case, is the risk calculation suite. Zoom in here. And then provides the name of the toolbox, RMC Event Tree Toolbox, along with the version number. Following that is some language that tells you what the toolbox does, what the purpose is. So the purpose of this toolbox, it generates a standard format sub-event tree or project event tree based on user-specified input. 
The next tab are terms and conditions. These are the same for each of our toolboxes. They're a bunch of legal language basically saying that we are not liable for how you use our tools. The next page or the next tab consists of version history. So the version history is where we will detail um, what revisions have been made to the toolbox um, and when. So you can see the version history the date the revisions were made, and the revision notes. And then we have a references tab. There are no references for this toolbox in particular, but if a, a toolbox does have references, it'll be listed here. So before I get into the event tree functionality, I see that there is something in the chat about macros being disabled by the administrator. So uh, this is an issue that we continuously run into uh, especially if you work for the core, that macros get in the way. So all of our toolboxes do contain macros. So there is, shoot, Gabrielle, I don't remember what the procedure is. I think there is a procedure that can allow you to, to open a toolbox and use it, but I'm not 100% sure on that. <clears throat> so um, if you're having issues with macros, I will try to, to hunt down something that can help you use the toolbox right now. Otherwise, uh, just follow along with the, the demonstration. And, and so are the macro users, um, is the person with the disabled macros a, a, a core employee, I'm assuming? Yes, I'm a core employee. Um, I work yeah. at the St. Louis district. I am on a, an RMC cadre here. I have a version 1.1 that I was sent by my cadre lead for a previous SQRA that I have that works. Um, so if the version 1.1 is still somewhat similar, I can at least follow along with that. Version I believe that everybody, everybody that's part of you says, I think you can go into the app portal and request, I think it's through the app portal, and request something to be downloaded that allows you to use these macros. But um, yeah, we can we can provide that information. I thought um, that you save the file as a Excel um, SM or whatever the extension is with an M at the end. Then you close Excel and reopen that new file, and the macro should work at that point. That yeah, used to so work. The, the toolbox are going to download probably as an XLSB, but they'll work as an XLSB or XLSM. I think you're right, Manel. If you're having issues with macros that you downloaded, save the file locally to your hard drive, whether that be your computer hard drive or external hard drive, and then close Excel and reopen it and see if that fixes the problem. I do remember that that is something that we've had success with in the past. Reg regarding version 1.1 versus 2.0, uh, version 1.1 doesn't have the project event tree functionality, and the event tree um, tabs have undergone some formatting changes. Nothing structural has changed on the event tree tabs, but Devin, you won't have these project event tree tabs at the bottom of version 1.1. Okay, I'll try resaving it and see if that works for version two. Just make sure when you reopen it, you're reopening the XLSM file. All right, so our first tab for sub event trees is this event tree input tab. And the first thing that you're gonna see when you open up the event tree input tab are limitations for use and directions for use. So there are some limitations with this toolbox. The biggest of which is that the event tree that this toolbox is capable of constructing is a single linear progression to breach. That means that if you have more than one branch on any node, you're going to have to manually override the toolbox and draw your event tree uh, yourself. So this toolbox will construct a single linear event tree um, without any problem. The intent of this worksheet is to create event tree graphics that have a standard format across all of our risk analyses and risk assessments that we can use to paste into our reports and presentations. It's uh, the intent of the worksheet of, of the toolbox is not to print an editable event tree. 
It's so that you can create an event tree in the toolbox and then copy and paste it as an image into a report or a presentation. So there are two steps when you're using the event tree input tab. The first step is going to be characterizing your, your sub event tree, starting with your initiating event. We've talked a lot about initiating events. You use a drop down list to select flood loading, seismic hazard, or other. There's conditional formatting within the toolbox. If you select flood loading or seismic hazard, the other box is going to stay grayed out. If you select other, you will see that this turns into a yellow box and you will specify whatever your initiating event is in that location. The next thing you do is define the number of nodes that you have in your event tree. You can select from one node up to nine nodes. Nine nodes is the maximum allowable by the worksheet. One is the minimum. I don't know of any one node event trees, but it's in there for completeness. And then these two options here include no titles and include no callouts. Those are also drop downs for yes or no, and we'll take a look at what those are when we get to the next tab. Once you've characterized your event tree in step one, you move on to step two when you define your node specific information. So for each node, you have the option of assigning a node title, a node description, and a node callout. So you do that for each node that you specify. For nodes that are not used in the event tree, based on how many nodes you selected up above, those nodes will have gray boxes around them. So you only need to fill out the nodes that have a white or a yellow uh, background. Once you have characterized your event tree, you go to the event tree tab. And here, the program or the worksheet will automatically draw your event tree and fill in all of the, the text boxes for you. So you remember, our initiator is a flood loading, and we have seven nodes in this event tree. So the boxes here are our node descriptions. The text over top of the node, those are our node titles. And the arrows and text boxes branching off of each of the nodes, those are our nodal callouts. Now, not every event tree is going to have node titles. And not every event tree is going to have node callouts. So it won't be uncommon for you to see and create an event tree that looks more like this. The node callouts are mostly used after the evaluation has been performed. So after you performed your risk evaluation, you can use those nodal callouts to provide justification for the estimates for each of your nodes. That's helpful when you have a report or a presentation and you really want to give a risk assessment on a page. That's what I call it. When you have your nodes, your node titles, and your node callouts with your justification for your elicited values, it really creates a nice one-page summary of your potential failure mode, which you then go into more depth and detail on in your nodal write-up. So that is a, a basic quick overview of the event tree functionality of the toolbox. We're gonna go into the project event tree tabs after module three. With that, are there any questions about the limitations or use of the event tree uh, input or event tree tabs in the toolbox? So Adam, I think, I guess I misspoke that it, you cannot create an event tree that is not linear using the toolbox. That's correct. That, that may be something that gets added in the future, but for now, this this format is all you can do. Um, if you needed to create an event tree with multiple branches, all of these objects that you see here, the circles, the triangles, you can move all those as you need to copy and paste. All of the lines for the event trees, those are just borders in Excel, so you can turn those borders on, off. So you can adjust the event tree however you need to, but um, without doing any customization, this format here is, is the limitation of the program. All right, any questions about the module, module two or the toolbox? Um, I answered, there was a seismic um, 
loading question. I answered that in the chat. Yeah, so let me let me show graphically what that would look like. So if you select seismic hazard, this this goes with what Gabriella is talking about. If you select seismic hazard, you're going to see when you go over to the event tree tab that you now have two loading variables out here, your seismic hazard and your coincidence stage, which is the stage duration that Gabriella referenced in her response. All right, All right. we have no other questions. Thanks, everybody.